So um, my name is Chris Cromer. I'm owner of a minor tune-up, as he said. And I'm sure you're wondering, brass. Well, that's no brass here at this thing. But um, the way it's relevant is that um, my career being in music, um, basically, August 10th, 1988, I went to my first concert. Uh, I was 14. My sister and her boyfriend took me to see Judas Priest, uh, not at Firefly, at the Spectrum, which is now, I think, a parking lot. Um, but basically, when that, when that concert was over, that was the first time I fell in love with music. Before then, it was background noise. It was, you know, uh, NPR on with mom playing the classical music and things like that. Um, but I never really felt anything about it until that point. It was excited, and I knew at that point, I didn't know how, but I knew I wanted to do something in music for a living. Um, why I was thinking about a career at 14, I don't know, but um, that's where it started for me. Um, you know, fast forward 16 years, I've been in business now, um, and generally speaking, what I do is I do repair, but only for brass instruments. So um, it started with that and kind of blossom into more of a boutique kind of niche business. And I work mainly with professional trumpet players, professional brass players. Um, basically, on a certain level, like um, a lot of my customers in the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, one of my customers plays for Justin Timberlake's band, another guy's in Real Big Fish, um, a lot of touring musicians who break their things at the airport. Um, so they call somebody, they call us me, and because I've somewhat developed a good reputation over the last 16 years, I'm the guy they call if they're anywhere between Boston and, I don't know, Virginia. Um, it's not uncommon for someone to drive three or five hours to see me just for one hour. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what I do and how I got there. Um, like I said, when I saw that concert and you know, I started taking guitar lessons, of course, um, as you can picture, instead of this, um, I had long hair about down to here, ripped up jeans, a jean jacket, and an earring uh, that is no longer there. And I went from that to playing the trumpet. Um, and I was okay at both of them, but it was just that thing where, you know, you, you start getting good at it, you start taking lessons, you start meeting other musicians, and you realize it's really difficult to make a living as a musician. Um, and you start thinking maybe there's other, other avenues. So my avenue for a while was um, to be a music teacher. Um, I started going to University of Delaware in 98. Um, and my intention was to teach music. High school band, I really dug that. I'd done it part-time for a little bit. Um, and while I was doing that, um, I was teaching marching band, and some of the instruments we were playing had some obvious issues with them, just, just technical things where you're like, this just isn't right. Um, and, you know, kind of leading to that, um, you know, the things I was good at as a kid was you know, fixing things and uh, tearing apart the VCR, which is an old-fashioned sentence now. Um, so when I saw these, I just I kind of took it upon myself to figure out a way to re-engineer some of them. And I remember I went down to the local music store. I grew up in Dover, went to Caesar Rodney, and I asked them, you know, hey, who can I call at this factory about these instruments, about how they're designed? I got some ideas. And I call this guy up, and I'm like, hey, so, you know, these are the issues. How, how come you guys don't design it a little differently? And he basically said, well, we're already the largest manufacturer of brass instruments in the country, so your band is going to buy them either way because we're the only game in town. And he, and he didn't say it as if he was trying to be a dick either. He just said it as if he was putting some heavy knowledge on me, like I was going to go, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. Great, awesome. Instead, I was like, I can't believe they make these things intentionally faulty or that you know, there's not more thought into this. And it just kind of put me off a little bit, and I started just rethinking everything at that point and questioning um, everything about the design of the instrument. So I started tinkering with things and soldering in my recliner in my apartment. Um, and when I accidentally almost set fire to the uh, recliner, I said, you know, I, I need a better place to do this. So since I was in school at UD, they had a little uh, room in the back of the, back where they kept the uh, music, uh, the, the instruments in the basement. And I asked if I could use this little space they had with a little workbench to just work on stuff in between class. So that's what I started doing. Um, and I was doing it not as a business, I just did it because I wanted some place not to burn my apartment down. And um, so my classmates started coming back there, and what are you doing back here? Just working on some things, fixing things, and kind of redesigning some things, and trying some ideas. But by that point, I'd already apprenticed with a, a friend of mine, now a friend of mine, who's a technician up there in Wilmington, and taught me general soldering, metal work, and things like that. And 
So I knew some things on how to fix them, fix things. So people started asking me to fix, you know, solder this and this is bent, this is broken. I started fixing these things and people just kind of assumed that I was in there like the school store. And so, you know, do you sell valve oil? Do you do this? And I was getting good at it. And uh, then one of my friends finally said, do you clean instruments? And I said, no, why would I do that? I don't need to learn how to clean an instrument. That's not what I'm down here for. Um, but he said, you know, nobody on campus has a sink big enough to fit their instrument in to clean it. So if you just did a general, like, scrub it out, you'd probably make some money. And it kind of hit me that this is a business opportunity, you know? I mean, we're just talking about nickel and dime stuff here and just cleaning instruments. But it, it kind of put it in my head that, you know, I, I'm starting to enjoy what I do. I'm starting to kind of get, you know, some respect for my peers of things that, you know, I was studying metallurgy and acoustics and studying old research journals of like some respected manufacturers back in the day. And I was starting to absorb a lot of information about this, about the design of brass instruments. And uh, so it, it started to kind of come out and people started saying, well, he knows what he's talking about, so ask him. You know, I started to become like the resident expert. Um, and I kind of was starting to fall a little out of love of teaching music at the time. And it just kind of was that thing where I made the decision that this is what I'm going to do. And so I, I still had a day job for years. I worked at MBNA for, for 14 years. And um, around the time when I was starting to really get some traction and get a lot of professional customers, get a really big following, um, one of the managers where I worked came by my desk. There was a magazine article written about my shop. And she comes by and she says, Chris, what are you doing here? I had no idea you did this for a living. You know, why are you working at the bank? And I said, I have no idea. And this is like a senior manager, too. And I looked her in the face. I said, I've been asking myself that same question. And I started, I just checked out at that point, like Peter Givens on Office Space. And just, you know, four, you know, four months later, I quit. And I started doing the shop full time. That was six years ago, I think. And, uh, you know, who, who, who knew it would turn into something like that? Um, I got a crib notes here, so bear with me. Uh, the interesting thing about my business is that, I mean, again, I'm working on a very narrow type of instrument. Um, I'm not working on everything. I don't fix guitars. I don't fix drums. I just fix brass. Um, and if you wrote that into a business plan and brought it to a bank for a loan, they'd laugh at you. You know, a lot of the, you know, it doesn't make sense what I do for a living that I can carve out any kind of living, let alone a good living. Um, and it, it, it's, it's just that thing where, you know, if I don't know what you guys do for a living or what you're thinking about doing for a living if you're in college, but... Um, there's, there's a lot of different things in the music business but beyond, beyond playing um, or even managing or doing sound. There's lots of things. Um, and it would have never occurred to me to uh, you know, do repair. I just kind of fell into it, you know. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that the, the, the point, I guess the message is that if you, you know, you're passionate about something and you kind of really put your heart into it, um, you know, you could make anything into a business, you know, it doesn't have to be what looks good on paper and what makes sense to the bank. Um, and you can do whatever you want. So who's next? That's a question. 